May 15, 1954. The Boeing Company has taken a huge risk. In the face of lack of interest from the American Airlines and the Air Force in a jet transport, Boeing has built one at its own expense. It has gambled a quarter of the net worth of the company. If it loses the gamble, the company will be bankrupt. If it wins, the face of air transportation will be changed forever. As the Dash 80 takes off for its first flight, the hopes of Boeing go with it. The Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum is the most visited museum in the world. Its collection contains some of the most important aircraft and spacecraft in history. Craft that were designed, built, and flown by men and women who have expanded the frontiers of flight. Today, the Dash 80, fully restored, sits in a hangar at Boeing Field in Seattle. Tex Johnston was Boeing's chief test pilot in the early 1950s. Testing the Dash 80 was his responsibility. The Dash 80 was not a prototype. It was a one-off demonstrator with a double purpose. It was designed to show the military that an airborne tanker powered by jets was the best vehicle to refuel the new generation of jet bombers. And it was also intended to show the world's airlines that their future lay in jets. One of the airplane's designations was 367-80. Within the Boeing company, this was considered a mouthful and the airplane became known simply as the Dash 80. Today, jet transportation is something we take for granted. But 50 years ago, few people dreamed of sites like this. In the 1930s and 40s, New generations of airplanes with two and later four piston engines revolutionized commercial air transportation. Progressively, they cut travel time and made flying a very attractive way to travel. While more people began to fly, Air travel was expensive and not available to the vast majority of the population. World War II had interrupted the development of air transportation, but had also stimulated the development of technology that would benefit the airlines after the war. In the war years, Boeing had concentrated on the development of large bombers, producing a string of successful designs from the B-17 to the B-29 and its post-war development, the B-50. These were highly developed airplanes. With supercharged engines and pressurized fuselages, they were capable of long range and high altitude performance that would translate well into commercial form. A military transport version of the B-29 had been developed during the war years. It was the brainchild of a bright young technical team recruited by Boeing in the early 40s. John Steiner was one of them. After the war, uh, it was necessary to some way hold the technical team together, and Wellwood Beale, actually, who was uh, with the company at that time, uh, invented the Stratocruiser 377, uh, which was a commercial airplane, but really was intended to hold the team together and not to make a lot of money. And we dreamed of better things. The Boeing Stratocruiser went into production in 1947. 55 were built, but they were not the way of the future. 
At the time, the U.S. Air Force was running a competition for a jet bomber. The Boeing team was not ready to enter. They wanted more time to study. Boeing then uh, asked the Air Force to defer the, their entry into the jet bomber competition because we were interested in examining the swept wing, which had just been uncovered. It was not invented uh, in Germany alone. It was invented both in Germany and by NASA, but was not ever thought of. Uh, at that time as a, as a uh, usable uh, piece of uh, technology because uh, reciprocating engines didn't want to go fast. But jet engines were a different proposition. Boeing's entry in the competition was the XB-47. Unlike its competitors, it wasn't a conversion or an adaptation of old piston engine designs. It had flexible swept wings and six jet engines. It was a real breakthrough. The XB-47 was competing with designs from Martin, North American, and Northrop. The performance of the swept wing six engine combination was superior to both straight wing and tailless designs. The B-47 entered production in 1948 and was eventually built in large numbers. The range of early jet engines was limited. Jet bombers needed to fly long distances. Therefore, aerial refueling was necessary. The standard Air Force tanker at the time was the Boeing KC-97, the military version of the Stratocruiser. Boeing had worked hard to develop an efficient system of aerial refueling. Their rigid boom had small wing surfaces so it could be controlled precisely in the air. The system worked well when the tanker and the receiving airplane were both piston engine powered. Their speed and altitude capability were similar, and they could easily fly in close formation. But when the receiving airplane was a jet, it was a different story. Instead of continuing to fly high and fast to refuel, the jet was forced to fly low and slow. At the time, Britain led the way in commercial jet transportation. The de Havilland Comet was the world's first jet transport. It flew for the first time in the summer of 1949. It had four jet engines mounted in the wing routes. It was capable of cruising at almost 500 miles an hour at an altitude of 40,000 feet. It had the potential to cut air travel time by half and was of great interest to the airlines of the world. It was also of great interest to rival aircraft manufacturers. In 1950, Boeing chairman William Allen traveled to Europe to try and raise interest in Boeing's own jet transport, a swept wing design with four jet engines. But there was no positive response. The de Havilland Comet went into service in 1952, smashing records on major international routes but in-flight structural failures ruined its reputation, and the comet was withdrawn from service in 1954. In the meantime, Boeing was developing the huge B-52. We, in 1950, uh, before the B-52 flew, but after the B-47 had a lot of flight tests, decided that we were through with propellers forever and that uh, the, the big airplane belonged to the jet. That was a, a sort of a startling decision in the, in the industry at that time. Nobody else made that decision as far as I know. Boeing was convinced of the need for a jet tanker. In 1950, the first production B-47s began to appear. They were greeted with enthusiasm, but they were still refueled by old KC-97 tankers. We thought that the government should, in fact, order a jet tanker. But the government in the persons, persons at Wright Field uh, didn't feel that way. They wanted a, a, uh, a tanker to be a transport, and that to them meant propellers. When the Korean War broke out, experience underlined the need for an efficient refueling system for jet aircraft. But still, in spite of intense lobbying at the highest level, 
Boeing couldn't convince the Air Force to change its mind and back the development of a jet tanker, nor could it raise any airline interest in a jet transport. There was a feeling among those of us that were enthusiastic that the only way we had to demonstrate commercial capability uh, was to build an airplane, a, a, a one of, um, an airplane. Uh, so that some of us got quite a head of steam up uh, around the, the airplane that would later be called the Dash 80. Boeing would have to use its own money to build this demonstrator. It would cost $16 million, which was about a quarter of the net worth of the company. For Chairman Bill Allen and the Boeing board, it was a huge gamble. And within the company, there was strong resistance to taking it. Uh, I was living in Magnolia at the time. I was driving to work with uh, a um, close to the chief financial officer of the company. And uh, when, we, when he heard that we were trying to sell a program or a company-sponsored demonstrator airplane of that size, he, he just laughed at me. He said, you know, Jack, you're living in a dream world. This company in no way is going to take a, a risk of $16 million, which seemed like a lot at that time. This company was not. Uh, wedded to commercial airplanes. In fact, the only thing they all knew about commercial airplanes is that we had financially failed on every program we'd ever attempted. The future of many people was at stake, but the supporters of the jet demonstrator idea were determined to take the risk. Uh, if you're not willing to stay in the game in spite of financial reverses, you shouldn't get in it at all. Some of us were, were well aware of what it was going to take uh, you could say, was the board of directors aware of what it was going to take? And I'd say, uh, to an extent, but not fully, they never are. The development of a commercial jet transport was a huge step for Boeing, and it could not be taken without pain. You're eventually going to have to face the board of directors and say, we did not anticipate it would be this bad if you want to take over uh, a piece of industry that you've been the underdog in. You, you better prepare yourself for facing your own board with bad financial news, and then doing it again and again and again. The demonstrator project had one strong ally. We were gifted in that we had the presence of Bill Allen, who was a very unusual chairman of the board, in that he was enthusiastic. And he had flown in a B-47, and he'd been converted to a jet advocate. Without him as a spokesman, we couldn't have done it. On April 15, 1952, the YB-52, Boeing's new big jet bomber, flew for the first time. A week later, Boeing held its annual general meeting. One of the main items on the agenda was the decision whether or not to take the gamble and build the jet demonstrator. With Alan's help, with his very dexterous help, uh, we were successful in convincing the company that we ought to launch uh, a program to build one demonstrator airplane of minimum cost without attempting to make a commercial airplane out of it, but was a demonstrator to, to demonstrate that the, the jet uh, uh, problems of the B-47 and B-52 could be overcome and that the airplane could in fact fly like a commercial airplane. At the time the Boeing board approved the demonstrator project, it was to be called the 707. But Bill Allen stepped in and changed the model designation to 367-80. 367 was the model number of the KC-97 piston engine tankers, and there is a theory that he was trying to mislead Boeing's competitors. The number 80 represented the 80th version developed under the 367 model number the demonstrator became known as the Dash 80. In the late 40s and early 50s, even the installation of jet engines on an airframe was a new and difficult design problem. Boeing had rejected engines mounted in the body or close underneath the wings. The Dash 80 shared the B-47 solution. The engine pods were mounted below and forward of the wing, where the pressure fields of pod and wing wouldn't interfere with each other. The B-47 and B-52 both had a tandem landing gear, with the main wheels housed in the fuselage and small outrigger wheels on the wings. This meant takeoffs and landings had to be flat, and stopping was difficult. 
The Dash 80 was designed with conventional tricycle landing gear with two sets of main wheels mounted in the wings and a nose wheel at the front of the fuselage. The landing gear system was designed to be familiar and comfortable for airline pilots and so were the flight controls. The horizontal stabilizer had a conventional elevator and the whole assembly could be adjusted for trim. There were conventional ailerons for banking and roll. The ailerons had small tabs to initiate control movements. The ailerons were supplemented by spoilers on the upper wing surfaces. They could be used in combination with the ailerons to increase roll rate or independently with all spoilers being used as speed brakes. Wing flaps increased the lift of the wing for takeoff and landing. The Dash 80 was officially rolled out of Boeing's Renton plant southeast of the city on May 15, 1954. It was christened by Mrs. William Boeing, and when it emerged into the Seattle spring sunlight, it carried with it many of the hopes and aspirations of its audience. To a 1950s crowd used to DC-3s, DC-6s, and Boeing Stratocruisers, it was a revolutionary sight. By now, the British de Havilland Comet 1 had been withdrawn from service because of in-flight structural failures. No other American manufacturer had produced a jet transport. At this point, although the Dash 80 had not flown, Boeing appeared to be in front of its competitors. Tex Johnston was Boeing's chief test pilot. He was responsible for the Dash 80 flight test program. But before the Dash 80 flew, there was an exhaustive program of ground tests to be carried out. Instrumentation aboard the Dash 80 was complex, designed to record flight control and structural information and monitor details of engine performance. The first series of ground tests involved taxiing over a wide speed range with a variety of maneuvers. Tex Johnston was at the controls on May 21st. And the steering, nose gear steering, and all these tests had, and braking, all these tests had been conducting prior to uh, uh, the initial flight. And uh, the brakes had been checked and so forth. And it was the last day before the initial flight, and I was going to take it right up to takeoff speed. Everything was absolutely perfect, and we taxied up very slowly to the to the uh, uh, exit from the runway on a, a taxi strip or to the main taxi strip. And as the airplane turned, by uh, that 90 degree turn, all of a sudden it just heeled over to the left. And I looked out the left pilot window here, and the number one engine was resting on the ground. And I looked back through this window here, and I could see the two of the landing gear wheels were protruding up through the wing surface. Uh, it was kind of a mess. Um, so we had to pick up the pieces, and of course, as, uh, as all things happen, why a lot of us were out there in the middle of the night looking at uh, what had happened and what do we do now with our, our wounded bird. Tests indicated that flawed metal components in the landing gear had failed, so the problem was in the materials, not the design. It took six weeks to repair the damage. On July 14, 1954, after further taxi tests involving high-stress maneuvers and a maximum speed taxi run, Boeing engineers declared the Dash 80 ready for flight. The flight plan called for takeoff from Renton Airport, initial evaluation of aerodynamic control, and testing of flaps and landing gear, retraction, and extension. 
After the tests were completed, the Dash 80 would land at Boeing Field in Seattle, which would be the base for the flight test program. Tex Johnson and his co-pilot Dix Loesch were more than aware of their responsibility. When they took off, they would be carrying Boeing's future with them. Renton Tower is Boeing 707, uh, we're cleared to come up on power. 707, Rogers. Of course, there's so many of the people of the population of this area that, uh, their future, to some degree, was uh, hinging on the success of this airplane. And uh, even to the non-technical uh, 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 observer, when you see the, the airplane take off and its climb angle and the rate of climb, and then when you make flybys, the speed, is, uh, it's obvious that uh, it's the airplane of the future. Tex put the airplane through its planned program. Performance in all tests was satisfactory. Flight test, do you read? Uh, this is Tex. We have been climbing for 8,700 feet. All engine operation is normal. Hydraulic pressures are normal. The airplane feels good. The red lines line up. As far as we can tell in the airplane, that the gear is down and locked. Coming in. Over flight test. I was uh, very satisfied with the airplane. The handling characteristics were ideal, and the uh, control forces were light. But uh, there are num numerous things that uh, we learned on the B-47 that uh, were plowed into this airplane that uh, resulted in, in uh, uh, a uh, it wasn't a really experimental airplane, it was just the next step in uh, jet transportation. There was an enthusiastic crowd waiting at Boeing Field. First to greet Tex as he left the airplane was Boeing Chairman Bill Allen. He uh, just uh, shook my hand and congratulated me on the flight and said, how is it? And so I, I convinced him uh, there in about um, five minutes of conversation that we had a winner. We invited uh, everybody to see the Dash 80 in Seattle. We were pretty proud of it, and of course it was out. It was public knowledge that it was out. We held a uh, meeting in Seattle. I was to speak on the stopping of large jet airplanes. The meeting did attract a lot of people, like the top engineers from uh, Douglas and Lockheed and uh, people from, from overseas as well. In the week before the meeting, Tex Johnston was returning from a test flight. He didn't know it, but a faulty safety valve had shut off the braking system. Tex Johnston landed the airplane on, on Boeing Field with no brakes. He didn't know he had no brakes, but he had none. Um, he went off the end of the runway, uh, almost made a, uh, a U-turn, but he got into a ditch and hit a great big piece of concrete and the nose gear folded under the airplane and put a big hole in the bottom of the airplane. It was kind of a mess. So here I was in front of uh, people down at a downtown uh, hotel with an uh, initial title of stopping large jet airplanes. Uh, so I sh led off with a big colored picture of the airplane standing on its nose with the tail up in the air. And I said, this is one way to stop large jet airplanes. <laughs> In its earliest form, the interior of the Dash 80 was just an empty shell. There were no passenger seats, just a complex array of test equipment for onboard monitoring of performance and flight characteristics. Although the Dash 80 was a demonstrator, it had first of all to be proven in its own right. That meant an intensive company flight test program before it went on the road to convert the military and the airlines to the idea of a jet transport. It was not ready yet to go public. 
But it's difficult to hide something as revolutionary as a jet transport demonstrator. And the curiosity of the industry had been sharpened at the meeting John Steiner had addressed about stopping large jet aircraft. The airplane was gaining a, a life of its own in the public view and in the in, in engineering view. And uh, my feeling is that uh, the very uh, fine Douglas engineers that were there uh, went home and immediately lit a fire under the the, uh, the start of what later became the DC-8 program because they realized they had a competitor, whether they liked it or whether they didn't, it was in the flesh. In the previous year, 1953, while the Dash 80 was being built, the Air Force had finally announced a jet tanker design competition. The growing fleet of B-52 long-range bombers still relied on the old Boeing KC-97 tankers for aerial refueling. It was a difficult and inefficient system. A B-52 being refueled by a KC-97 had to fly just above stalling speed. For the Dash 80 to demonstrate superior capability as a fuel tanker, a retractable refueling boom had to be fitted. This boom was tested on the ground at Boeing's boom testing tower before it was installed in the Dash 80. The boom tower was a comprehensive testing facility Boeing had developed during its long involvement with aerial refueling technology. Before the refueling boom was fitted, the Dash 80 flew in close formation with a B-52 to check stability and control characteristics in the refueling position. When these tests were successful, a section of the Dash 80's rear fuselage was removed and replaced with the pod that would house the refueling boom. The installation of this pod was highly critical. Dash 80 would be flying at high speed and high altitude only feet away from the receiving airplane. It was crucial that the airflow over the modified rear end of the fuselage did not change the airplane's handling characteristics. The pod not only contained the boom, it also housed the boom controller who lay flat out facing the tail. The controller could raise one section of the pod, opening a window from which he could see the whole refueling operation. With his left hand, the operator controlled the extension and retraction of the boom. With his right, he handled the control surfaces on the boom itself. These were called rudder vators and allowed the operator to actually fly the boom to the refueling point on the receiving aircraft. There was no fuel transfer system aboard the Dash 80, and no additional fuel was carried. So the series of tests flown in this format was called the dry boom tests. At first, the aerodynamic effects of the boom pod itself were analyzed. Then a chase plane made close observations of the behavior of the extended boom in flight at an altitude of 26,000 feet and speeds up to Mach 0.8, or eight-tenths the speed of sound. The boom was tested right through its control range before flight contact with a B-52 receiving airplane was made. The dry boom tests proved conclusively that a jet tanker could refuel jet bombers at speeds and altitudes far beyond the capability of piston engine airplanes. But that in itself was not enough. When we finally were able to sell the tanker to the government, we had to do it in a manner that the, the, the Air Force, which was dead set against, let's say, a Boeing tanker, because they wanted to invent whatever tanker they bought. And here, Boeing had a prototype flying, and they didn't design it, and they didn't pay for it, and they didn't own it. Um, so it was an embarrassment. Uh, the, the, uh, the contract, of course, uh, for the tanker was to be decided on the basis of a competition. I ran Boeing's end of that competition. I lost. Uh, Lockheed won the competition. 
and they set about going to buy Lockheed uh, tankers. Uh, but the Strategic Air Command under General Lee May wanted a tanker, wanted a jet tanker badly for the B-52 and B-47. And he could throw his weight around a little. The other one was that we had an airplane flying, we could offer delivery dates that no one could offer. And we could offer prices that were, that were fixed and were believable. Uh, as you know, in any military contract, uh, when you start in, the question is one of credibility. Uh, you can lo bid a low price, but if it's not credible, it's not worth taking. And so uh, when Boeing made their proposal uh, for a jet tanker interim quantity uh, to be derived from the demonstrator, uh, the, uh, uh, the Strategic Air Command uh, requirement prevailed, and the Air Force bought 17 um, uh, KC-135s with the strict instruction to everybody involved that not a dime should be spent on thinking about airplanes beyond number 17. Those were all going to be Lockheed airplanes. It was an un, uh, unpleasant uh, situation to work in. On the other hand, uh, we did work in it, and we, uh, we were successful. And of course, the, there were more than 800 KC-135s built. Once the interim order was placed, it wasn't simply a matter of turning out a series of Dash 80 replicas. Boeing had learned a great deal in a short time and the KC-135 order gave the engineers a chance to take a second look at the design. Many revisions were made, and the airplane that emerged was substantially different from the Dash 80. The Dash 80 had a narrow fuselage, only 132 inches in diameter. The KC-135 was built 12 inches wider, with a fuselage diameter of 144 inches in the hope that the same tooling could be used to produce both Air Force tanker and commercial passenger versions. It was a nice idea, but while it worked well for the KC-135's living area, it wouldn't save Boeing any money on development of the commercial version. The first KC-135 of the initial order of 13 emerged from Boeing's factory in July 1956, it proved to be the right airplane at the right time. In spite of the Air Force's initial reluctance, the KC-135 became a great success. Uh, once the Strategic Air Command had them in service, uh, they loved them because they had to have a jet tanker. And this was a jet tanker, and they, the fact that there might have been a better jet tanker was not very important to them. The Cold War was intense. American long-range bombers were constantly in the air, and KC-135s were soon helping to keep them there. Redhead 2-2, two -two, your range is five miles. Roger, five miles. The boom operator takes up his position in the pod at the rear of the airplane. The bomber to be refueled is a B-52. Pilot, this is boom operator. I have him in sight. Okay, boomer, you're cleared for command. The operator lowers the boom and guides the B-52 in. Rotor vaders on the boom allow the operator to fly it precisely into position. Over two. Stand by for contact. Tanker contact. Receiver contact. Fuel is transferred at a rate of 1,000 gallons a minute. The B-52 is refueled in the air 
without having to lose altitude or fly at dangerously low speeds. The jet tanker Boeing and the Dash 80 worked so hard to promote is a reality. More than 800 KC-135s were built, and many are still in use. Not all were tankers. They were used for reconnaissance, electronic countermeasures, and many other military missions like personnel and medical transport. In the two years it took to develop and build the first KC-135s, the Dash 80 was used in its other role as a demonstrator to convince the airlines of the world that their future lay in large jets. Even its early flights had been impressive. In October 1955, it flew from Seattle to Andrews Air Force Base in Washington, D.C. in three hours and 48 minutes at an average speed of 595 miles an hour. It made the return trip in just over four hours, cutting the normal propeller airplane time by half. Boeing went all out to secure the interest of the airlines and maintain the lead its gamble in producing the Dash 80 had given. But Douglas was now developing the DC-8, and they benefited from Boeing's mistakes. The DC-8's wing area would be larger, and it would have a wider fuselage cross-section. In 1955, the Dash 80 made demonstration flights for many airlines. Boeing's strategy was not only to win the interest of airline executives, but also the approval of the people who would fly the airplane. We tried to make the Dash 80 such that we could demonstrate it to airline pilots and they would accept it. Now most pilots like a lively airplane and the Dash 80 being a jet and having swept wings uh, was a lively airplane. It wasn't as lively as some of its uh, successive models but, but it was still in their opinion a lively airplane and yet it was fairly docile on the ground. Tex Johnston was well aware just how lively the Dash 80 was. He saw a need to share this knowledge with the public. Uh, we, Boeing, had the, the first jet airplane, which was going to reduce the size of the world by a factor of two when measured by flight time. Uh, never before in the history of aviation has there been such a gigantic step. I was convinced that, uh, that uh, the people should really understand what, what the, get their attention, in other words. The annual unlimited hydroplane races during Seattle's Seafair Week always attracted huge crowds. In 1955, the International Air Transport Association and the Society of Aeronautical Engineers planned to hold their annual meetings in Seattle, coinciding with Seafair Week. Boeing Chairman Bill Allen asked Tex to make a test flight on Gold Cup Day with a pass over the Gold Cup course. Tex realized he had a unique opportunity. Aviation people from all over the world would be watching. Telling no one, he planned his own special demonstration of the Dash 80's capability. And I turned to my co-pilot, uh, Jim Gannett, and uh, said, I'm going to roll this uh, airplane over the Gold Cup course. And uh, his uh, mouth fell open and uh, he said, geez, uh, that's uh, do you think you'll uh, get fired? And I said, well, possibly, but I don't think so. Uh, Tex had no announced plan, nor was there any consideration of making a barrel roll over the, over the, uh, uh, the speedboat course on Lake Washington that day at all. In fact, he didn't have a minimum crew. I did a 180-degree turn, came back down over the water, pulled up, established a climb, put in full aileron, 
did a nice 1G roll and came out in level flight. And I knew that no one would believe what they had seen. So I turned around and came back and repeated the same thing on the westerly heading. I happened to be out at the course. I was not on one of the boats, but I came out on the course and I saw him make the barrel rolls and uh, I was dumbfounded. And I was as close to the program as anyone was. So uh, he changed sort of forever the image, let's say, of the Boeing Company and uh, of the Dash 80 with that one maneuver. Because of course it got in all the newspapers. The airplane was not an aerobatic airplane, but as I say, he wasn't taking any chance with the structure of the airplane. He had to answer to Bill Allen, who was furious. He was absolutely furious. He, uh, he felt uh, Texas endangered the whole program. And I explained to him how the maneuver is conducted, that it's a 1G maneuver, that the airplane never knows it was upside down, that I wouldn't jeopardize the equipment. You've got to keep 1G on it all the time. To, you can't uncover the fuel pumps, the hydraulic pumps, oil pumps. You know. I, I perfected aerobatics years and years ago, and that's, uh, it's a one, as I say, a 1G maneuver. And Mr. Allen's comment was, you know that, now we know it, but just don't do it anymore. And that's the only uh, thing that I ever heard about it. There were some problems that Tex had to answer for, but as it became evident that Tex had done something he wasn't supposed to do, but he had sort of made the program a lot better than it had been and a lot more advertised than it had ever been. Uh, I guess, uh, I don't know whether Alan ever forgave him. I don't think Alan ever told him, uh, I'm sorry I rebuked you so badly. I don't think that ever happened. Boeing's image had been transformed and the Dash 80 demonstrations to all the airlines were enthusiastically received. But Boeing's first chance of winning a big order was not a success. On October 13, 1955, Pan American announced an order of 25 Douglas DC-8s and 20 Boeing 707s, as the production airplane was to be called. Just 12 days later, United Airlines announced an order for 30 Douglas DC-8s. Boeing was paying the price for being first in the market. It could demonstrate a jet transport in the flesh, certainly, and that was appreciated by airline executives like Eastern's Eddie Rickenbacker. But it was apparent that Boeing had made a mistake in using a body diameter that wouldn't seat six abreast. Even though it was being widened for the KC-135 and the production 707, it was still too narrow. So while Tex Johnston gave the airlines a taste of what it was like to pilot and fly as a passenger in a big jet, Boeing engineers searched for ways to make up lost ground and recover the initiative in selling their 707 to the airlines. Their first job was to convince the Boeing board that even more money had to be spent on making changes to the Dash 80 design. The Dash 80 was doing its job. It could demonstrate the speed and smoothness of jet power but it was not enough. It was never supposed to be more than a demonstrator. We knew that the body diameter was probably wrong. It was 132 inches, which meant it was not six abreast. Uh, I was probably the it man in trying to get the company to realize that, that it didn't have a prototype. It had a demonstrator, and that's all. Uh, and I probably prepared all the data uh, that uh, was prepared to show the company that the body diameter of the Dash 80 was not a commercial body diameter, it was the wrong body diameter. Which, of course, from their standpoint, from the board's standpoint, they could even say, uh, uh, you didn't tell us all this, did you? And uh, I'd say no. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there was going to be a lot worse things in the future. By the time the first 707 was being built, a major financial decision had been made. It was painful for the Boeing board, but it would make the 707 more competitive with the DC-8. So we changed the body completely between the Dash 80 and uh, the KC-135, and then changed it completely again between the KC-135 and the initial 707-120. January 25, 1958. 
The first production 707-120 carries 104 American Airlines passengers on the first scheduled jet transcontinental flight in four hours and three minutes. But Boeing's major concern was with intercontinental travel. They'd realized early that Pan American had only ordered 707s as an interim measure because of their early delivery date. Boeing knew Douglas's DC-8 had a larger wing than the 120 and more powerful engines. More drastic action was called for. We made a decision back in the Bill Allen's hotel suite in the Ritz Tower to put a new wing on our airplane uh, and build essentially a new airplane out of it. Uh, these were, uh, uh, each one of these were traumatic financially, and we were building up a, a uh, enmity in the financial community within the company that knew almost no limits. Uh, a lot of them, of course, had been enemies of the commercial program from the very start. Uh, so now they found that these darn guys are going to get the commercial market, but they're going to bankrupt us. When you change the wing for everything in board of the nacelles, you've got essentially a new wing. You've, the, the amount you've, you've saved, sure, you could save the ailerons and the outboard flaps, but you haven't saved much in the way of the wing structure. So that we had to redesign the whole thing and, and put essentially a new wing and called it the 320 airplane. Now, the 320 airplane had the range that Pan American wanted, and so we got uh, gradually uh, into a position where Pan American favored the Boeing airplane rather than the Douglas airplane. Uh, this was not because of a difference in range, because the DC-8 and the 707-320 were about the same range. But the, the and I, I say this rather carefully, uh, the high-speed, high-altitude characteristics gained from our vast experience with the other airplanes uh, had put us in a little better position. And the 707 always had better high-altitude, high-speed characteristics than the DC-8 and still does today for those that are flying. By the time the 707-320 Intercontinental was ready to fly, the 707 project was deeply in debt. The major modifications to the original Dash 80 design had driven Boeing's investment much higher than the original $16 million it cost to develop the demonstrator. Two major changes of fuselage cross-section, a new wing, and new engines had increased the debt to a frightening level. But by the late 1950s, perseverance and determination were beginning to pay off. Minor modifications were made to attract customers. Improved engines were installed. Freighter versions were developed, and the design was adapted for other uses. The site of Boeing 707s at international airports around the world became more and more common. The growing number of jets on international air routes revolutionized international travel, drawing passengers away from ocean liners into the high altitude and high speed of jet flight. The 707 program eventually uh, long, long after it was supposed to break even, did finally break even and make some money for the company. But it was never uh, a, a really successful financial program until long, long after it was supposed to be. It was hundreds of airplanes later than it was supposed to be in terms of break even. Almost 1,707s were built, all of them owing their existence to Boeing's gamble on the Dash 80. For years, the Dash 80 was used by Boeing as a flying test bed. Then in 1972, it was donated to the National Air and Space Museum and flown to Arizona for storage. Boeing offered to restore it in 1990 and flew it back to Seattle. Among the passengers who made that flight was Tex Johnston, now retired from a long and distinguished career. The faded paint was stripped from the Dash 80's fuselage and a new coat in the original color scheme applied. 
Hello-80 was presented to the National Air and Space Museum in 1972. It is still housed in a hangar at Boeing Field in Seattle, ready to fly once more to a permanent home with the National Air and Space Museum.